Welcome, everyone. If I could have your, if I could have your attention, please. Thank you. We're about ready to begin. We have a full house today. I was about to say we still have a few seats in the front. We actually have one seat remaining in the front if anyone's interested in, in laying claim. And for those of you who for, are looking for a seat but didn't get one, as Professor Lynn wrote on the board, we do have overflow seating in room 200 directly above and a broadcast of today's events um, there. Um, I'm Joe Helbley and I'm the Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering and I'd just like to welcome all of you to this second annual Great Issues in Energy Symposium. As some of you know, three years ago the Thayer School established energy as one of two key areas for focused program and faculty growth. We had and have an established faculty base who works on technology issues such as biofuels, energy efficient electronics, energy efficient de-icing technology, materials for energy capture and storage technology. Um, and just this week to this exciting base effort, we've added a dynamic young faculty member, Dr. Jifeng Liu from MIT, who will be joining us this fall working on nanomaterials for solar energy applications. We also anticipate beginning another search for another faculty member in the energy area again this fall as we continue to expand and build this effort. Now energy and its link to the environment has long been an important issue and I would argue perhaps the most important issue driving interest in engineering education. Now let me just ask a question. How many of you have heard over the past three or four years that it was the launch of Sputnik in 1957 that inspired interest in engineering as a field and um, led to significant growth in the 50s and 60s and we need another Sputnik moment. Anyone? Right. I can't tell you how many times I've heard those remarks made. It's a wonderful story, but the fact is it's not true. If you look at engineering enrollments in the US in the 50s and 60s into the early 70s, there was some growth, but it was very slight growth. The significant growth in interest in engineering and technology, engineering education in this country happened not in the 50s and 60s post Sputnik, but it happened in the mid to late 70s and the early 1980s. In an era when the EPA had just been established, when we made this direct link between energy and the environment, when the price of oil skyrocketed and suddenly energy, energy supply, and the energy and environment link were on the front page of every newspaper in this country. That interest largely faded away in the 1980s when the price of oil dropped and some other global events occurred. But um, look around you, pay attention to what you're hearing in the news today and you'll see that very much we're uh, experiencing the same level of attention to energy and the energy environment link as an issue. We're seeing it directly here at the Thayer School. Over the past five years, we have seen a 95% increase, 95% increase in the number of high school students applying to Dartmouth College who are saying they're interested in majoring in engineering. 95% growth in five years. And our enrollments are at the largest they've ever been in the 143 year history of the school at all levels, AB to PhD. And I'm convinced that this interest in the role of engineering and tackling grand challenges like energy or the energy and environment link is a key reason. In part because of this focus, last year we started what we intend to be an annual symposium entitled Great Issues in Energy. Our intention with this symposium is to focus on a single issue in one afternoon or evening's program, a single issue in the energy and environment area. Last year in the inaugural symposium we focused on climate and this year we will be focusing on the nuclear option or the role of nuclear energy in addressing the energy and environment challenge. Although many, many people have been involved in planning and organizing this event, the intellectual founder and leader of this effort is Professor Lee Lin, a global expert in cellulosic biofuels technology and the Paul and Joan Quineau Distinguished Professor in Environmental Engineering Design here at the Thayer School. It's my pleasure to introduce Lee as the chair and moderator of today's discussion. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, 
So welcome, you know, it's a lot of fun to uh, be involved in putting on an event and have all the chairs full, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to try to do two very simple things before we get on with the, the, the program. I uh, just want to outline uh, the, the schedule and then introduce the, what I think is a fantastically exciting uh, slate of speakers. Uh, so to keep it simple, we, each of the speakers will be presenting for approximately 20 minutes. That will take roughly an hour. And then we're going to um, have everybody, all the speakers seated up front. And uh, the co-moderator, who I'll take this opportunity to introduce, uh, Professor Andrew Samwick from the Economics Department and also uh, the director of the Rockefeller Center, and I will be uh, co-moderating the discussion. We'll ask a few questions, but then quickly turn it over to you uh, to, to ask questions of this distinguished group. We should be all done, roughly 5.15, and there are going to be refreshments and a reception uh, out in the Great Hall. Uh, Joe Rahm, one of our speakers, has uh, recently written a book and will be out there with copies of his book. For those of you just coming, uh, copies of his book, for those of you coming in uh, just lately, there is, uh, th this event will be projected immediately upstairs in room 200, so if it's more comfortable or becomes more comfortable to head up there uh, by all means. So uh, with that, um, I just am, am, am so thrilled uh, to welcome uh, Ernie Moniz, Joe Rahm, and Alex Glaser uh, here, uh, as, as well as, as Andrew Samwick from Dartmouth, as I mentioned. And so I'm going to introduce all three of them now and then just let their uh, presentations follow each other. Uh, Ernest Moniz is the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Physics and Engineering Systems, the Director of the Energy Initiative and Director of the Laboratory for Energy and the Environment at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Moniz's research contributions span theoretical nuclear physics and energy technology and pol policy. He was associate director for science in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office of the President in 1995 through 1997, Under Secretary of Energy at the United States Department of Energy, uh, 97 to 2001, and currently serves on President Obama's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology and Blue Ribbon Commission on uh, America's Nuclear Future, and if I'm not mistaken, PCAST as well, although that didn't make the written uh, version here somehow. My editing mistake, I think. He's a, a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, the Humboldt Foundation, and the American Physical Society, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Moniz received the Seymour Cray HPCC Industry Recognition Award for Vision and Leadership in Advancing Scientific Simulation and the Grand Cross of the Order of Makarios, is that close? Makarios III for contributions to the development of research, technology, and education in Cyprus. And believe me, that is a partial list. Um, Dr. Joe Rahm, uh, like, like Ernie, very broadly versed in energy, but nuclear not the least, is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and it would be easier to read, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is a climate, climate expert, a physicist, an author, a blogger, and an editor of the blog climateprogress.org. Dr. Rahm focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing energy security through energy efficiency and green energy and transportation technologies. Senior positions he, had ha he has held at the U.S. Department of Energy include Principal De Deputy Assistant and Special Assistant for Policy and Planning. Rome's acclaimed books and articles, of which this is a very partial list, include Hell and High Water, Global Warming, The Solution, The Politics, and What We Should Do, and The Self-Limiting Future of Nuclear Power. His newest book is Straight Up, America's Fiercest Climate Blogger Takes on the Status Quo Media, Politicians, and Clean Energy Solutions. He's a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and was named to Rolling Stone Magazine's list of 100 people who are changing America. In naming him to the list of 2009 Heroes of the Environment, Time Magazine called Rom the web's most influential climate blogger and I left out the part about your involvement in comedy in the DC area, which I noted with interest. 
Um, in any case, and last and not by no means least, Dr. Alex Glaser is an assistant professor at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University. Professor Glaser is actively involved in research on technical aspects of nuclear energy use and related fuel cycle technologies, and specifically on questions related to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. He's been an advisor to the German Ministry of Environment and Reactor Safety and a member of a joint working group of the American Physical Society and the American Academy for the Advancement of Science on Nuclear Forensics. He's an associate editor of the Journal of Science and Global Security, a member of the Science and Global Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and the research staff of the International Panel on Fissile Materials. With that, I'm going to sit down and join you in listening. So, first speaker is Ernie Moniz. <laughs> Is this working? Uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, I can't believe you dig up all this stuff and fail to mention that Joe Rome took e &M from me at MIT. I mean, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, kick off this uh, session. Uh, what happened to the slides? <laughs> B. 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 Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, the... Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a little bit of a context, actually, first. I mean, uh, as, as Dean Helbley said, uh, uh, we're kind of focusing on one issue, uh, nuclear power, um, uh, and I think principally in the context of, of climate risk mitigation, at least that's my uh, perspective uh, on it. Uh, uh, but I think it's worth maybe putting a little bit of a context uh, 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 in terms of particularly the power sector more generally as opposed to the entire energy uh, sector uh, and specifically the power sector in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, where, I, in, again, in my view, and I think the other speakers would agree, uh, the overarching challenge is that of, in fact, decarbonizing uh, the power sector over time. It's the sector where we have, at least today, the most uh, nearly cost-effective uh, uh, options, uh, uh, apart from demand management. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we, of course, have some expressed uh, rather aggressive goals in terms of carbon management. If we take the, uh, the current administrations and the Congresses, at least current uh, uh, legislation, uh, in terms of the kinds of reductions in carbon we're talking about, I think you know. 17% uh, reduction uh, to 2020 uh, and the order of an 80% reduction in 2050. I think it's inter interesting to ask uh, again, focusing on the power sector particularly, uh, what real options do we have uh, in different time periods? Uh, and at least in my view, the options that are material on the 17% scale for the 2020 goal are fundamentally two, demand reduction and replacing old coal plants with gas. The next decade now, more options will open up. And in fact, I believe our job is, and the job of government in particular, is to provide the options for the marketplace in a credible time frame, which I would say is the order of 10 years. So in, this, in the next decade, uh, we'll, we'll come back to whether, what the tests are, uh, the marketplace tests are. But in the next decade, then nuclear is a possibility for a material contribution uh, to carbon reduction. Demand reduction, of course. Ongoing use of natural gas as carbon light, uh, at least in the early stages of this carbon, carbon reduction. Renewables growing in more strongly in that decade. In my view, uh, carbon capture and sequestration still a decade away from material penetration. But as we go down, clearly we have more and more option space opening up, uh, and we must use the time effectively uh, to establish those options, again, for marketplace choice. But now let's go to nuclear. I've already said, in my perspective, uh, this will be a decade of establishing the viability of nuclear power. We'll discuss this through, with public subsidies playing a, a critical role. Uh, let's find out by 2020 if that dog hunts, basically. Uh, and then we will see what the choices are the following decade. It's a little bit of a different story internationally, as I'll describe, uh, as we do see much more activity today in terms of nuclear plant construction. Uh, but that's at least the framework in which I think about uh, this nuclear option 
uh, going forward. So again, reference frame. For me, as I've already said, it's about greenhouse gas emissions uh, as the only driver that makes public policy supporting nuclear power uh, appropriate at this stage. The nuclear renaissance. Well, first of all, what's the scale? If nuclear power is to be material in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we have to be talking about terawatt or gigaton carbon scale, let's say by mid-century. That, that is essentially a tripling of nuclear power, which would not do much for nuclear power's market share in terms of global, global electricity, given projected increases in demand. Uh, in the United States, a tripling would roughly increase the market share uh, by about 50%. But that's the scale. Uh, if nuclear power, if we add a plant here and a plant there, uh, that may be fine for a vendor. Uh, it doesn't do much as far as solving the, 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 the carbon problem. So that's, that's a scale I think we have to think about. If we do have tripling, it's inevitable that we will have, as we are already seeing, concerns uh, about nuclear fuel cycle development feeding, in, feeding in, into proliferation. So th th that's issues we must discuss. Well, actually, let's go first uh, in terms of this nuclear renaissance issue. Uh, this shows in a four-year time frame <laughs> the difference of perspective uh, in terms of nuclear power uh, growing, uh, going from almost nothing uh, several years ago to a 2007 prediction of about 115 uh, gigawatts globally uh, uh, in this time period to 2030. Now, whenever you see something change that fast, you should be suspicious, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, and also note that uh, if we look at today's activity, I mean, there is activity going in this direction. Uh, today, uh, there are about 44 plants uh, under, uh, under construction, uh, which, which, as you can see, uh, the majority uh, in three places, really, uh, China, Russia, and India, well, four places, uh, and, uh, and South Korea uh, following behind. In the United States, we are working on finishing a plant that was started and stopped some time ago, a couple in Europe, basically, uh, but fundamentally the action, uh, India, Russia, China, and uh, uh, Korea. Now, in terms of reference frame, another very important point, and again, we can come back and discuss these in detail, but let's have as a reference point is a lot of uranium. Uranium is not the constraint on nuclear power growth in this century. Third, I would add, uh, I think the perspective of most, the science of geological isolation of spent fuel and high-level waste is scientifically sound for well-chosen sites with good project execution. Those are qualifiers that are of direct relevance in the United States, uh, but I think the issues are that there's a lot of uranium, fundamentally geolo geological isolation is sound, uh, we have to execute. But both of those have a consequence, and I'm just kind of giving conclusions, which we can argue about later on if you wish, that for the United States, uh, in our view, there is no sensible path forward for the next one to two decades at least uh, of if we're going to have nuclear power, it's going to be light water reactors, and we're not going to reprocess the fuel unless we are kind of silly. But we'll come back to that. Um, I suspect we will come back to that. Um, finally, in terms of this reference frame, uh, and it kind of follows from some of, some of what I just, just, just said, uh, we believe that the storage of spent nuclear fuel for a century or so should be, at, should be thought of as a key part of design of the overall fuel cycle. Uh, uh, I just quote one, one reference, the American Physical Society Panel on Public Affair. The basic point is, on a technical basis, there is no rush. And given that there's no rush, you would think this, like other business, businesses, might value the preservation of options. Indeed, there's no guarantee that this once through fuel cycle with light water reactors will be the optimum choice if nuclear power grows dramatically uh, later on in this century. But if we are managing the fuel rather cheaply and, and, and safely, uh, we can dispose of it or we can reprocess it way down the road if we have a better uh, and economic technology uh, that gives us a reason to go to a closed fuel cycle. 
there are significant uncertainties that will influence and should influence the choice of those fuel cycles down the road. For example, the scale of nuclear deployment. If nuclear power does not grow appreciably, roughly speaking, we'd be nuts to start going into some more advanced fuel cycle. If it does grow dramatically, different ball game. Maybe we want to go to a technology that uh, is viewed as mitigating uh, uh, waste management uh, challenges. The cost of advanced reactors. By advanced, I mean anything besides a light water reactor. Uh, a lot of discussions about fast reactors, breeder reactors, etc. Well, the fact is, every indication we have today is they're very expensive, and the capital cost of nuclear reactors is, in fact, probably the long pole in the tent uh, in, terms of, in terms of scale of deployment. And also, these different fuel cycle choices that we can make in the future lead to very fundamental choices. For example, suppose we take the canonical fuel cycle of the future, decided upon in the 1970s for two incorrect reasons. One incorrect reason was we had no uranium. And so we better go to fast breeder reactors with high conversion ratios. Once you had that, then you were led to the idea that you had to have sodium-cooled, plutonium-fed reactors. Well, it turns out we get a lot of uranium. And secondly, light water reactors were not the transient technology that they were assumed to be at that time by observation. But the whole path forward in France and Russia going to plutonium recycling was based upon that idea of having to move quickly towards plutonium breeding reactors, plutonium fed. Well, as I just said, that's by no means obvious. Indeed, if you look at the transition, at the dynamics of developing a fuel cycle in a growing nuclear fuel deployment scenario in this century, it turns out a conversion ratio, how much plutonium you make in the reactor versus what went in, a conversion ratio of 1 is just as good as a conversion ratio of 1.2 or 1.3. But once you relax that, you can design a very different reactor. Once you decide on that, you can feed it with uranium rather than plutonium. So we do not know today whether the best choice tomorrow is for today's spent fuel to be trash or an energy resource. But if we have long-term storage as a sensible part of the fuel cycle, we preserve options. That, in many ways, is the main story uh, in terms of going forward. And the answer is, to the extent to which we deploy more nuclear power today, just keep doing what we're doing. That, fundamentally, is the place to go. Now, let me say a few words. I still have some time, Lee. Uh, yes? Um, say a few words about some of the more specific criteria. I mean, I've given you my framework, and I'll just say as much more as there's time to say, and then I'll stop. Um, uh, certainly, economics are critical. Spent fuel management is critical. Proliferation, proliferation risks are critical. Let me first talk about economics. This is an update that we did uh, last year. In terms of the economics of what you might call the three, at least today, the three base load technologies, nuclear power, uh, supercritical coal combustion plants, and natural gas combined cycle. Uh, very important, I should say here, this assumes a natural gas cost of $7, which is slightly higher than, uh, than, than today, uh, but that's, that's, what that, that's what's in there. Now, notice a few things that are very important. Obviously, in the nuclear, nuclear power case, the, the levelized cost of electricity is completely dominated by the capital cost. And the operating cost is very low. Natural gas is the flip. Very low capital cost. It's all fuel cost. That's the first point. Second point, because of that, you also have to understand in the dynamics of building and financing plants, or planning, while nuclear has the high upfront capital cost, its low operating cost means if you build it, 
it will always be producing electrons, whereas natural gas with the high variable cost is the last to dispatch in a system. And that's why natural gas plants today, the base load kind of plants, have only about a 40% capacity factor because the fuel cost has them not dispatched until you need it on top of nuclear and then coal. That's a very important dynamic in there. A second dynamic that is important because of this cost structure, now on the other side, is that in the United States, our utilities have very low, very small balance sheets. We don't have the kind of national champions that you see in France, where the government owns 85% of the utility, or in Germany, uh, other, other European countries. That has a huge implication for financing six and seven billion dollar plants. So after we go through a period of federal subsidy for the first movers, we have a major unanswered question as to how the financing would go if there were to be a dramatic expansion. That actually could be one of the limit, limiting factors. Third, as you see on here, I have something called risk premium. In our economics, we say that today, if you go to what we used to call Wall Street, uh, I guess if you go to the Treasury today, I don't know, uh, 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 that rational financing would put a higher cost of financing a nuclear power plant. Now, I don't mean with loan guarantees from the government. That's a, presumably a transitory issue. And so we, we expect that there is a higher equity requirement and a higher return on equity required. Well, as you can see, that's not trivial. That's about a cent and a half per kilowatt hour uh, 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 burden on nuclear power plants from different, different financing. So what about going forward? Two major things could happen to change this balance. Well, I'll say three major things. One is these first nuclear power plants get built very successfully. They're on budget. They're on time. They crank out electrons. They're on 92% of the time. Uh, they, look, they look pretty good. The risk premium comes down. Suddenly, nuclear then becomes on a levelized cost basis, already competitive uh, with these others. Secondly, of course, natural gas prices could miraculously stay low for a long time. You probably all know the shale gas story. We have a lot of gas. Prices have come down, probably more the recession in the end. Uh, but, uh, but you can judge that. But in general, utilities feel there is a risk in the volatility of gas prices. And the third is we all anticipate, well, not, not all, I should say all, maybe all in this all the speakers brain, maybe, I'm not sure, uh, anticipate there will be a carbon charge. And even a very modest carbon charge, like $25 a ton of CO2, as you can see, has a substantial effect on coal and a non-trivial effect on nuclear. So we don't know how these factors will play out. But I would just say that certainly on a levelized cost basis, uh, nuclear, uh, as a carbon-free source, uh, uh, certainly looks to be a credible candidate uh, for expansion, again, the decade after this one, in my view, after we see whether we can actually build these plants in the United States uh, successfully. How much time do I have, uh, uh, Lee? Uh, do, this slide. do this slide. Okay. Um, Sorry, that wasn't a uh, uh, let's see. Um, well, okay, I've already talked about long-term fuel cycle choices in, 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 in the beginning, um, uh, what they are. Um, let me see if I want to say anything else. Um, uh, da, 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 I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Um, I'll, sk I'll, le I'll leave this for after uh, the last speaker. We'll, we can talk about nuclear fuel leasing. Uh, let, me just, let me just end by going to the subject of, of R&D and say that... Uh, in, in, uh, in our view, the research and development program uh, the Department of Energy has had now for some time, uh, and of course I claim no responsibility, uh, even though I was there for several years, uh, uh, really has had uh, a very poor alignment with the strategic choices of getting to see whether this dog hunts in the carbon reduction game. Uh, the focus uh, the last several years uh, was on 
the super duper fuel cycle in the sky that might or might not have implications 50 years from now. There's a lot of stuff that we could do and should be doing to align with the real path forward, improving light water reactors, increasing their efficiency, new fuel forms, new forms of storage, new forms of alternative disposals. For example, maybe we do want to eventually separate out from spent fuel just the very long-lived isotopes that we want to put into a teeny weeny package into a five kilometer borehole in hard rock. I'm not saying we should do that, but we have been brain dead in thinking about alternatives uh, by law, actually, for over 20 years. And this program needs to be uh, rejuvenated and realigned principally with the goals going forward. Now, long-term options clearly should be part of it. We need to use the time to look, to look for these advanced, advanced uh, uh, places. But this should be more basic research and not the kind of rush to choosing the technologies and demonstration projects way, way prematurely. And the last thing I would say is that uh, this has been a business where, uh, frankly, the business is not anywhere near those of other major, let me call them manufacturing sectors, in the use of tools like modern modeling and simulation. And so this is an example. Now, the good news is there is a competition going on right now for a so-called innovation hub, $25 million a year, specifically to develop the simulation tools aimed at improving light water reactors. That, I think, is an example of now getting aligned with what the real business is, facing the carbon challenge, and finding out if nuclear will or will not be a major contributor. Thank you.
you had James Hansen here last year, I guess, so you, you know that the planet is, in fact, warming uh, and that humans are to cause. <laughs> um, so I don't have to spend a lot of time uh, uh, re-explaining that, except to say that even in the years since he spoke, things have probably gotten more dire uh, in terms of, A, our knowledge uh, uh, of climate change and, and uh, our knowledge of the feedbacks. Um, we're just, you know, uh, the, the billions of tons of heat trapping gases that we are pouring in the atmosphere are trapping heat. Um, most of it goes into the ocean, uh, which isn't as well measured as the land uh, and atmosphere, uh, the land warming. But, um, uh, and interestingly, this was a science study that came out in the fall. Uh, this is the Arctic uh, uh, temperature over the last 2,000 years. We'd probably be slowly heading into an ice age if it weren't for human emissions. Uh, but uh, as I'm sure Hansen said, as long as humans are out there emitting carbon, we're, we're not going back into another ice age. Um, and, uh, you know, the Arctic will go ice free in the lifetime of most of the people in this room. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was essentially ice free within 10 years. Um, you know, some people view it as essentially ice free now. There's virtually no uh, ice in the Arctic that has a lifetime that, that's longer than two-year ice. So it's just the, the, Nas the National Snow and Ice Data Center just released uh, their, their, their data on that. So the, we, we spent a lot of time looking at ice area, but it's volume uh, that really matters. And the volume uh, has dropped maybe 50% uh, over the past decade. And unfortunately, that's just a, you know, a harbinger of things to come. The bigger concern is what happens to Greenland and Antarctica. Turns out they're both dynamically uh, shedding uh, ice and study just came out suggesting actually that the, uh, that the point of no return uh, uh, would be sustained emissions of 500 to 600 parts per million. We're, we're at about 380 parts per million of carbon dioxide emissions. 280 was the pre-industrial level and we will hit 500 by mid-century on our current emissions path. Um, and uh, just, I'll just do a couple slides on this because, uh, I, again, I think it's just a salient point. Um, the, the key problem is that as you lose the sea ice, uh, you're replacing something that's reflective with something that's absorptive, like uh, uh, the ocean or land. Uh, that's polar amplification. You heat up the Arctic. Uh, that causes uh, the warming in general within about 1,500 kilometers of the Arctic, which happens to be where the permafrost and tundra are. There is twice as much carbon locked away frozen in the permafrost as there is in the atmosphere today. If you release it quickly, it's going to come out as methane, which has a considerably higher near-term uh, heat trapping capability as CO2. Um, 20 times is actually just the, uh, I think, the, the century integrated heat trapping. If, if you look at how much more heat it traps over a 10-year period, it's like 100 times as much. Um, so you can't, if you cross these points uh, where you start releasing huge amounts of methane from the tundra, uh, then it becomes a very, very desperate race to cut emissions uh, and actually go negative before the feedbacks uh, blow things out of the water. Um, we've had a very stable climate. This is just a very crude graph I got from Bob Carell, but this is, the, we, we've been in a very narrow temperature range for 10,000 years. Uh, and we will blow, we're, we're just now edging out of as warm as we've ever been uh, during human civilization, and we're going to blow past that uh, this decade uh, into realms of warming that, that, that humans have never seen. Um, a major new study in science, again last year, the last time CO2 levels were about 100 parts per million higher, and we're going up two parts per million a year, uh, was 15 million years ago when it was 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer and sea levels were 75 to 120 feet higher. And uh, as I'm sure Hansen told you, at this level, sustained for any length of time, the planet will go ice free. There's just, there's just uh, from a paleo climate and, and any reasonable uh, analytical perspective, the planet goes ice free. The only question is how long it takes. Um, and uh, the good news for Dartmouth is that you're probably in one of the few places in the country that's, that's good. Uh, you're, you're, you're not anywhere near this, the coastlines. Uh, you're not 
anywhere near uh, the, the Gulf Coast. You're not anywhere near the Southwest, which will be turned into a permanent dust bowl. Um, you're not near the West, which is being devastated by the bark beetles and, and pests and droughts and wildfires. Um, and you get a fair amount of rain, and that'll probably go up. Uh, so stay, stay put. You don't want to go to like, you don't want to go to MIT or Harvard. That, they will uh, have to figure out what the heck they're going to do by the end of the century. This is actually the projected number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the 2090s. Uh, and that is, say, Kansas, 120 days above 90. A very different country. That's not the worst case. I always feel obliged to say that's business as usual. That's, that's the, the MIT Joint Center analysis. This is just business as usual. The worst case was something the Hadley Center did, high emissions, high feedbacks, uh, very, uh, a world let's hope we don't get into where you're talking 7 to 10 degrees centigrade uh, over much of the US, and that might only be 50 to 60 years away. So the point is no sane civilization would ever want to risk doing anything like this. Um, and you know you get uh, how much sea level rise by the end of the century? Maybe four to six feet, maybe rising an inch a year. No one knows for sure. Uh, the latest studies are in the four to six feet range, but but the the modeling is is just begun. Studies again suggesting a uh, permanent dust bowl uh, uh, for the U.S. Southwest. Um, the oceans uh, we're we're acidifying the oceans now at a level. Uh, 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 at a rate, there was just a study that came out comparable to what happened during to the, 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 the PETM massive extinction. Um, and we don't know how to reverse most of these things. I, I have no doubt that if we're stupid enough to keep doing this, that all the great universities are going to be devoting most of their effort to figuring out how to mitigate, how to adapt, and how to reverse this stuff. I mean, I don't. How you unacidify the oceans will be one of the great challenges for the human race. Um, uh, and of course, then there's peak oil, uh, which, which is, is I, I think, uh, uh, just, there's just simply no way to provide oil uh, at a per capita level, even comparable to South Korea for the world, let, or, uh, let alone for the United States. Um, if you just took the per capita uh, oil consumption of South Korea for India and China at their population levels, they would consume as much oil as the entire world does today, which is about 80 million barrels a day. And, and as Ernie and I were chatting here, no one knows how you get much above 100 million barrels a day uh, sustained. So it's not going to happen. So um, the cert I, you know, I, I just say I, the future is known with a very high degree of certainty. We are going to be carbon free. Uh, and, and we are going to replace the energy system uh, of the rich countries and the, and the developing countries are, are they'll, you know, may develop in a dirty fashion for a bit longer, but again, they're going to go carbon free and, and all of you who are still in school, I think, are going to live to see it. And it is going to be one of the great desperate dashes of the human race. Um, I, the to-do the to list is, 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 <laughs> is nothing. I, I actually... This is a slide that, that, that a, a friend of mine, Pete Didesheim, actually inserted when I went up to, to give a talk in Maine. He, he, he said, my slides have too much information on them and <laughs> don't get to the heart of the matter quickly. So this is my uh, slide from Pete. Um, the, that's, so the bad news is that uh, the business as usual path is really incomprehensibly bad and it could be worse than that. Um, so. Uh, the also bad news is that you need a, the world uses a staggering amount of energy now, and it's going to be using even more in the future. Um, and uh, it's all got to be carbon free. I mean, I think by the end of the century, I, Ernie, I think, would agree with this, we're going to have to be close to zero and ideally negative total net carbon emissions for the human race. That's a heck of a challenge. Um, and uh, you know, I use the stabilization wedges just to give a, a rough order of magnitude of things. The stabilization wedges are things that over a 50-year time frame ultimately start saving a gigaton of carbon a year. Um, if we were to wait until 2020 to start doing these wedges and we did 10 of them, we would ruin the planet. 
this would take us to 9 degrees, 10 degrees Fahrenheit planetary warming. If you want to avoid catastrophic warming, you need to start now, and you need about 13 or so wedges. And I, uh, I, I people should go to my blog, climateprogress.org, uh, if you don't already. I go through all this in detail. One, one can't possibly go through any of this stuff in a talk. I just put this out here. This is, I think, what will happen, something like this. I, in my, uh, on, on the blog, I go into uh, uh, a couple of different scenarios. But fundamentally, this is the scale of what is needed. 5,000 gigawatts peak of solar thermal. One wedge of photovoltaics is 2,000 gigawatts peak. Um, one wedge of nuclear, and this was, uh, you know, the Keystone Group did a whole study on this. One wedge of nuclear is 700 new gigawatts and then you're going to have to replace the old ones, you know, over the next 40 years, certainly most of them. So that's a thousand nuclear plants over a time frame of 40 to 50 years. You know, you, you, it's a staggering amount of plants. We're only building, I don't know, three or four a year. And six or seven. Six or seven now. This is the world. This is the world. Oh, absolutely. This is the whole world's going to do this. Um, and so we're up to six or seven, which is good news. We need to be at about five times that level to do a wedge of nuclear. Um, and that's just one wedge. As I say, you need, you need 13 wedges. That wedge of nuclear would, would certainly make the nuclear industry exceedingly happy. Um, um, so, uh, but, so a couple of points of this slide. Even if we did this staggering increase of nuclear power, even if there is enough uranium to power all those nuclear power plants, uh, Ernius sanguine about that. Um, uh, uh, other folks I, I talk to are not so sanguine that there is, in fact, enough uranium. Um, Nate Lewis leaned over to me in a talk, and, and a Caltech professor who, who follows these things, he was kind of skeptical that there is a man, uh, excuse me, there is that kind of uranium. But the point is, one nuclear uh, wedge is is, is under 10% of the solution. So we're going to be doing a whole bunch of everything. So I'm, I'm glad all that the engineering school here is, is shifting over to energy. I have no doubt that come the 2020s, uh, the major universities of the world, world will be doing little else. I mean, the civil engineering departments will be doing a great deal of work on levees and, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, I. What one can state with very high probability, I, w I gave a talk at a school about you know, being em employable in a carbon-constrained world. And um, there are a few times where you can know this early on in a century what the obsession of the century is going to be and what the guaranteed jobs of the century are going to be. Uh, you know, it's like if, if you become an expert on diabetes, you're, in, you're rock solid for having a job. Uh, and, <laughs> It, it, if you're working on sea level, you know, if you're working on controlling sea level rise or, or, or low carbon energy, uh, you, you know, it, it is guaranteed employment. Um, I, I, let me just talk a little bit about, about nuclear. The biggest problem with nuclear uh, is that in the U.S. it has just totally priced itself out of the market. Um, what you know, you t the, the United States has a huge amount of baseload power. I mean, really too much baseload power in some sense, power that, that is basically round the clock. And it, it isn't what is mostly needed uh, in the future. What, what, what utilities need is to meet the demand as it comes. Uh, uh, they need lower capital uh, uh, projects. They need things that are smaller. Uh, we're in a very low demand growth world, a, a country as it is. We, the EIA dropped its electricity demand growth, I think, below 1% per year. Huge investments are going into energy efficiency. Huge investments are going into demand response. Um, and a lot of mandates for renewables. So uh, in an uncarbon constrained world, there's, there's just not much of a future uh, uh, for nuclear. Uh, there are lots of interesting technologies that can load follow. Uh, uh, that are coming along the pike now. Uh, and natural gas, because it turns out there's more than people thought, uh, is, is certainly high on the list. I'm a very bit bullish on solar thermal, and combining, in fact, solar thermal with natural gas uh, is, is, I think, uh, uh, one of the key uh, strategies going forward. Um, and this is, this is actually John Wellinghoff, the, the head of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, just uh, a year ago. Um, 
I think baseload capacity is going to become an anachronism. You don't need fossil fuel or nuclear plants that run all the time. We may not need any more ever. Um, and you know, he's in a position to, to know. Uh, uh, the problem with nuclear power uh, is, that, is that it has literally become priceless. I mean, Arriva, the French nuclear giant, uh, made a deal with the Finns that went quite south. Uh, and bitter legal disputes over who was responsible for cost overruns to the point where now Arriva doubled their finished price. Uh, they're now at about $7,000 a kilowatt, and since we're building you know, uh, 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 gigawatt-type plants, this is $7 billion, $8 billion uh, for a power plant. I put an asterisk next to the Arriva uh, price because Arriva will not guarantee this price. This is the price they will bid, but they will not guarantee it. Um, and in fact, I, you know, I think a, a, a central point is we have, and I have a slide on this, no one knows what the actual price of a nuclear power plant in this country will be because there is no vendor who will go to a public utility commission hearing and guarantee that price. Um, and Progress Energy, which tripled their price and is now at about $7,700 a kilowatt, including transmission, uh, what did I write down? They actually said that, that, that uh, again, this was not a price that they were prepared to stand behind in a rate hearing. This, this price could go up. Uh, the Turks took a soul. The only people who bid for a Turkish reactor were the Russians, and they wanted 21 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the the a big uh, 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 bid that was just in Ontario, uh, Arriva put in a bid of $7,000 a kilowatt. They they lost, the, the bid that won was the Atomic Energy of Canada, the CANDU system, which was $10,800 a kilowatt. Arriva didn't win because they had a lower price, but they would not guarantee that price. Um, and again, this is, this is uh, uh, the, the Director of Strategy and Research at the World Nuclear Association said, what is clear is it is completely impossible to produce definitive estimates for nuclear costs at this time. Uh, the city analysis said, we see very little prospect of these costs falling and every likelihood of them rising further. Uh, and Moody's uh, said, we think the probability that things will go wrong with these large projects is greater than the probability that things will go right. And uh, the, the problem is, and this was Lou Hay, the chairman and CEO of FPL, after they did their analysis, the cost uh, uh, of a two-unit plant would be on the order of magnitude of 13 to 14 billion dollars. Uh, that's half or more of the market cap of all the companies in the industry, with the exception of Exelon. It's just a heck of a bet. And in fact, when I was at the DOE, this was something that Hazel O'Leary used to say. And she came from a nuclear utility. And people would always ask her about, you know, who killed nuclear power? Why don't we have nuclear power? It's the board of directors. <laughs> it is the board of directors. It's not the environmental community. It's not. It is the board of directors. It is. It is a gamble of the country of the company. You know. Absent a carbon price, a nuclear power plant is a really bad idea. I mean, it doesn't fit the nimble, low electricity demand growth market that we're now in. Uh, its costs are ungovernable, and the risks to your balance sheet uh, and your bond rating. Moody's basically threatened to lower the bond rating. I mean, they didn't threaten. They just published a report saying it is with high likelihood that any utility that took a nuclear power plant, a new nuclear power plant, would, would risk their bond rating. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, the, the, the world energy resource that is kind of the big dog here is solar, and that's where everything's going to come from eventually. Um, you know, all these, you know, uranium, there's a lot of uranium. There's a lot of gas, probably more gas than on this bubble now. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, you know, over the course of your lifetime, I think most of the growth ultimately is going to come certainly from renewables and ultimately from solar. I'm, I'm very bullish on just turning sunlight uh, uh, into heat that spins a turbine, a concentrated solar thermal power. I think that's, that's the way to go. You could power the entire U.S. with that grid uh, of solar. The good news is you don't have to power the entire U.S. in solar. Uh, 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 I think we, we have to go, uh, you know, ultimately uh, uh, mostly carbon free as uh, uh, in four decades. I think we will ultimately go mostly carbon free in four decades. Uh, right now, the big question is the House of Representatives passed the bill. I don't know 
the, the, the chances in the Senate are right now, you know, uh, well, anyone can look at how the Senate operates. It doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, uh, uh, there's no, you know, uh, uh, any bipartisan consensus anymore. It'll be very interesting to see what happens when Kerry Lieberman and, and, and Senator Graham uh, from South Carolina introduce their bill in a couple of weeks. Um, the tragedy of all of, of 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 where we are politically is that the rest of the world is 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 we are the laggard country. Almost every other country in the world has made a major commitment either to reduce their emissions or, or get off of business as usual. And if the U.S. were able to actually pass a piece of legislation that would uh, allow us to have a global deal, we could have a global deal that would put us not exactly on path to stabilize at, at safe levels, but. Uh, uh, a good chunk of the way there and give us the opportunity, as Ernie said, to, to then develop and commercialize technology so that when we get really desperate in 10 years, we can, we can deploy them on mass scale. So, you know, I would just end by saying Stra Straight Up is the title of my book. You can, yeah, I have a few copies here, but it'd be much better if you went to Amazon and bought it. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, Scientists predicted what's happening. They said you pour heat trapping gases in the atmosphere and you're going to trap heat. And, uh, you know, it's kind of really basic physics. And it's amazing that uh, the scientific community has been so inept in its messaging, that the media has been so pathetic in its reporting, uh, and that, and that uh, a massive disinformation campaign uh, has been so successful at convincing people that the most basic element of physics, uh, that heat trapping gases don't trap heat, uh, uh, that half the country has been persuaded that that's actually plausible. Um, but, you know, polls do not uh, change the laws of physics. And right now, much of what's happening is happening at a faster rate than scientists predicted. And what scientists are predicting now, I mean, MIT, when MIT changed its projection of what would happen on business as usual emissions, they doubled the, the temperature uh, uh, projection. So uh, we got to cut emissions quickly and sharply. Uh, we're either going to do it quickly and sharply, or we're going to wait a little while and do it even more quickly and even more sharply, which I think will be rather unpleasant. Um, but the future is just about preordained. We're going off of carbon. and. Right now, in this country, I think nuclear is the most expensive option. Uh, efficiency and efficiency are very hard to beat. I think a bunch of renewables, uh, particularly combined with natural gas, uh, uh, are, are the way to go. And you can get more details on this uh, at my blog, climateprogress.org. Thank you very much. Try to remember to transfer the microphone this time. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. And the next speaker is Alex Blazer. Let me see, can I get this? Uh... That's fine. That's you. Okay. Well, thank you. So um, much has been said, and I guess uh, I actually agree with most of it. Let's see if I can add something useful to um, the debate. What I'm trying to do in the next uh, 15 minutes is um, first put this here on full screen. No, not. <laughs> here we go. Um, looks better. What I'm trying to do is um, explore uh, the scale and the geography of a potential uh, expansion of nuclear energy, both uh, the short-term and the long-term perspective. And then based on these insights, and I'm not sure where to put this, I, uh, <laughs> I will briefly outline what I think the priorities um, 
should be with regard uh, to nuclear energy today and for the next decade. And as uh, Lee mentioned in the introduction, um, what I think the most disabling um, uh, attribute of nuclear energy is actually the, the weapons connection or the potential weapons connection. And we should and you know, have to use the next decade to kind of decouple nuclear energy use uh, from, uh, from uh, nuclear proliferation. Uh, so, But before I get into this, uh, let me briefly uh, summarize uh, the situation today. And again, I think you've seen some of these uh, numbers already. Um, um, here on this chart, on this uh, map, you see uh, the situation on nuclear power today. We're looking at uh, 438 reactors in uh, 30 countries. And, and I just added one, I guess, that came online last week or so. But basically, um, the situation has been um, we're sitting at this uh, level for the lab. We've been sitting there for the last 20 years. Uh, there hasn't been much capacity uh, added to the grid. Uh, nuclear energy provides about 14% globally uh, today. Uh, but of course, the, the fleet is aging. And um, even though there are now uh, lifetime extensions being uh, discussed, at some point we would have to uh, dis uh, replace the existing fleet if we uh, decide to keep nuclear energy on the table. Uh, again, what you see on the map, uh, 30 countries, but uh, as you can see from the numbers, uh, it's actually quite concentrated in a few countries. Uh, actually, uh, three countries um, have more than 50% of the total capacity, and that's uh, the United States, uh, France, and uh, Japan. And more than 80% of the capacity is concentrated in uh, 10 countries. And the question is, uh, will that be uh, the, the case in the future, too? So, you know, Basically, the question uh, comes down to you know, where do we go uh, from, from here? And uh, what I'm trying to do is really uh, focus very briefly on both uh, the long-term and the short-term perspective, because I think they're kind of different, and we can learn different uh, things uh, from both. So let me begin uh, with the long-term uh, projections. First, uh, what you see here on this uh, chart is um, the, the kind of the range of long-term electricity demand uh, projections. Uh, this is based on um, the modeling results from a large uh, number of different groups uh, around the world. Uh, and you can essentially see what uh, these projections predict uh, about a five to seven fold increase of electricity use by uh, the end of uh, the century. And um, uh, whatever your technology preferences are, um, just by kind of looking at the, the scale of the problem, uh, it's quite, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine how we're going to kind of uh, produce that much electricity uh, in a carbon uh, neutral way, uh, even if we keep all uh, the options uh, on the table. And, and some use this argument as a way of basically saying up front, this is why we have to pursue nuclear energy too. But I would argue the main message from this chart is actually we should really make sure uh, that we end up at the, you know, very low end of, of this projection. Um, you know, and use as little energy by the end of the, the century as, as uh, possible. Uh, now, if we go back a little bit to, say, 2050, 2060, uh, you'll see that we uh, were looking at about a three-fold uh, increase in, in electricity demand up from 2,000 to maybe 6,000 gigawatts. And um, so if we, take, um, if we keep nuclear energy for a moment and assume that it uh, may have, say, 25% uh, market share, which would be roughly uh, twice as much as today, we'd be looking at 6,000 divided by 4, about 1,500 uh, gigawatt of nuclear energy. Just to give us a perspective, and um, Rob Sokolow and I, we kind of define this actually as one wedge and, and not 700 gigawatts, assuming that uh, nuclear would not only replace coal, it would also displace uh, some co uh, gas. Uh, so in a sense, there's a, uh, a certain trade-off because the wedge model really says you can only count uh, something that um, you wouldn't do otherwise anyway. So some, you know, it's between one and two wedges, uh, 1,500 gigawatts. And the question is, where would you actually uh, deploy this capacity? So here we're going back to uh, 2010. Uh, and here is uh, just a picture and that, that's extracted from uh, the MIT study in which uh, Ernie Moniz was involved, the 2003 one, which suggested uh, that we may be looking at maybe around 60 countries uh, using nuclear energy in, in such a scenario, uh, which is about twice as many as uh, we have today. Um, and here's a different, not sure why there is no legend. It's been uh, classified, I guess. Um, 
but you can get the idea. So this uh, map actually highlights those countries in red uh, that have recently expressed interest in, in nuclear energy. And according to the IEA, um, uh, we're looking at now more than 60 countries uh, that have exp you know, approached the International Atomic Energy Agency and asked for assistance. I was trying to find out uh, you know, who these countries are. I was actually only able to identify 50. So you imagine there are 10 more in this map. And basically means uh, you know, most, almost everyone uh, has expressed interest um, going into this uh, business. Now, I do think that these newcomers actually do reserve uh, kind of a certain respect uh, you know, that other countries also enjoyed when they first kind of went or considered nuclear energy. Uh, but I also think that these countries do uh, deserve uh, some good advice uh, about what it means uh, to kind of embark into a nuclear program, uh, and not only by those companies uh, that are actually trying to sell them uh, reactors. But now um, what, what is relevant, though, is I think that it's also clear that um, most of these programs um, small programs won't make uh, a big difference in mitigating climate change. Um, um, and at the same time, though, they, they are very relevant in terms of uh, safety, uh, waste disposal, and in my view, uh, non-proliferation uh, concerns. And that's something we have to uh, keep in mind. Uh, but the, the main message for me, at least, is uh, that we, if we do consider a global expansion of nuclear energy, um, it, uh, it really means uh, that we're looking at a, uh, a global deployment uh, of the technology, including in the developing world and including in regions that we would consider politically unstable today. And if we think that's not feasible, not possible, then I think uh, nuclear energy may not be on the table as a possible solution uh, to climate change. So that's the long term and, and global picture. Um, and I said, okay, let's go back and actually look at the next decade. And I think Ernie Moniz and I, in, in, in many respects, agree on that one. And um, what I'd like to do here very briefly is uh, turn your attention um, to a recent report that was released by the National Academies. Uh, I think it's a very um, balanced and thoughtful report. And um, the, most importantly, the report confirms uh, that deployment of existing energy efficiency technologies is the nearest term and lowest cost uh, option for reducing energy demand and carbon emissions. That's uh, very clear, the, one of the key, or the, the, the key finding of the study. But of course, it also has to say a few words about nuclear energy. It actually has a chapter on nuclear energy. And uh, you know, it's thick um, as a phone book. Uh, but here you find um, kind of the, the most remarkable sentence, I think, in, in the executive summary. Uh, saying that basically the next decade uh, it will be needed to demonstrate the viability to, of two key technologies. One is uh, CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage, and two is uh, here highlighted, demonstrated with, demonstrate whether nuclear plants are commercially viable in the United States by constructing a suite of about five plants, and sometimes in the report they actually talk about five to nine plants uh, during the next uh, decade. <coughs> And uh, it's clear uh, that uh, these plans would be supported by loan guarantees. They would be subsidized. Otherwise, um, you know, no one would build them. Uh, but anyway, in, uh, in summary, I think we can uh, kind of uh, see the next decade in the following way. Uh, very little capacity will be added in the United States, uh, five to nine uh, plans, and even less so in Western Europe. Uh, there may be even maybe one or two. Uh, little, if any, capacity will come online in these so-called newcomer countries. Uh, they, this is also beyond 2020. Uh, the big wild card, of course, is China. China will build a certain number of uh, nuclear power plants, but they're essentially building everything at the same time. Uh, but basically, the lesson is that by the end of the decade, uh, we will probably understand better the economics of nuclear power, uh, as well as some other constraints for both uh, nuclear and its competitors. And uh, again, uh, that's also part of the study. We may, at that point, take options off the table. And uh, if, uh, in particular, uh, these uh, suite of five nine to nine reactors cannot be constructed on time and on budget, uh, then, uh, the, so concludes the academy, uh, it's unlikely that more plans uh, will follow at that point. And I would add, and that's now my uh, own perspective, uh, if uh, we consider a global deployment scenario, as I've shown before, still unacceptable, for instance, for non-proliferation reasons at that point, then too, we may have to consider or reconsider the nuclear option and take it off the table. 
So you might be wondering, so what, are we, what should we do in the meantime then? We have 10 years, and I think there are a few things we, we can and should do. And uh, I'll uh, focus on uh, just two of them. Um, number one, and I guess Ernie has emphasized this already, uh, we should uh, stay away from reprocessing. Um, let me just very quickly uh, show you uh, the situation today. Uh, regarding reprocessing plutonium recycling, uh, the world is uh, now divided. Um, there are essentially four countries that are deeply committed to reprocessing. Uh, these are uh, Chi uh, France, India, uh, Japan, and Russia. Uh, China is now looking into reprocessing, and uh, so is uh, South Korea. Uh, uh, the UK is um, sitting on the fence and deciding what, what it's going to do. Uh, so far, not a single country that decided to pursue commercial reprocessing has managed to balance uh, the, uh, the, the rate of separation and use of, of plutonium. And you can see the result uh, of this history and process uh, in this chart. Uh, the uh, shown here are the, the total global inventory of plutonium in uh, black and sh uh, grades of shea, the military uh, ones, and green um, are the, uh, the civilian inventories. And if you add them up, uh, they are hypothetically, this is enough material for enough uh, for about 30,000 uh, weapons, which is quite uh, you know, staggering. And uh, here's another way to look at the, uh, at this data, at the situation. Uh, here showing the size of the civilian uh, stockpile today uh, compared to the amounts of plutonium in weapons. Uh, and uh, just yesterday, um, President uh, Obama and Medvedev uh, signed uh, a new arms control treaty, the start on follow on or the new start treaty, uh, which would reduce uh, the number of deployed we uh, warheads down to around 1,500 weapons. Uh, you know, if you take all this into account and throw in uh, tactical weapons and uh, uh, weapons in reserve, there would be 15,000 warheads roughly. But you see how in a disarming world, uh, the civilian stockpile would actually start to dominate uh, the, uh, uh, the global plutonium inventory. And uh, I would argue, unless reprocessing of spent fuel comes really to an end, uh, the world will become increasingly preoccupied uh, with latent proliferation and breakout capabilities, even if nuclear energy does not expand. Uh, but you know, in particular, if it does expand and relies on reprocessing. Um, so that's uh, number one. I have a, you know, if you ask me, okay, what should we do instead in terms of uh, technical uh, kind of R&D, uh, I do think um, that these uh, small reactors that are now being uh, discussed uh, kind of in various uh, circles offer some interesting uh, kind of perspectives. Uh, some of them are based on proven technology. Uh, and some of them, or most of them, have some innovative uh, features that are not easily to, um, cannot easily be dismissed. Um, you know, there's underground construction, uh, long uh, refueling re cycles, and uh, of course you have lower um, upfront capital cost, even though the, the levelized cost of electricity might be higher, the upfront investment might be a bit lower, or you know, sig significantly lower, which in itself is appealing uh, to the utilities. Uh, that was on the, the technical side. Uh, here comes a more uh, a challenging uh, proposition. And, but again, I think it would be critical if nuclear power is to play a role in the future. And that's um, the need to, for a new framework of the nuclear fuel cycle. And what you can see here um, are the, uh, the global enrichment capacities in 2010. I already said the, the power capacities are highly concentrated. Uh, but the enrichment capacities are even more concentrated. And it, it matters because with uh, these enrichment plans um, come, you know, intended or not, uh, in important proliferation and, and breakout uh, capabilities. And um, um, the key technology here uh, are uh, centrifuges, and essentially all new plants will be based on uh, the centrifuge a process and centrifuge technology has uh, two important features. One is rapid breakout. You can essentially convert uh, an existing commercial plant that produces fuel for power reactors within a matter of days and, and make it um, produce highly enriched uranium, which can be used in weapons. That's a unique feature that other enrichment technologies did not have. So rapid breakout. And second is uh, the clandestine option. It's very hard to detect. Um, undeclared clandestine enrichment facilities. And um, 
I'm sure you've probably seen some of those pictures. This is the Dantan site in, in Iran a few years ago. And the actual um, uh, uh, centrifuge plant is built underground and highlighted here. And here you see uh, you know, President Ahmadinejad walking uh, along uh, the machines. And you know, what is perhaps unique about the centri centrifuge technology is um, now the, the prestige that now has become uh, attached to this uh, uh, technology and kind of the symbolic role it plays in kind of expressing the rights of Article 4 and having the inalienable right to uh, use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Uh, that's not only in Iran, but I think it's actually el uh, true elsewhere too. Uh, and I unfortunately think this is not going to uh, kind of go away uh, anytime soon. So going back to uh, the enrichment capacities today, um, now I kind of have here uh, enrichment capacities we would need uh, to support uh, 1,500 gigawatts uh, of um, nuclear uh, electricity worldwide. And it's a very different picture. And um, again, I would argue uh, if this picture is sufficiently inattractive, um, in, in, in such a deployment scenario, then nuclear power may not be on the list of solutions uh, to climate change. And unfortunately, there is no simple solution to this dilemma. And um, uh, what we're basically trying to do is uh, two things. We're trying to prevent uh, the spread of sensitive, sensitive to nuclear technologies to additional countries. That's A. And B, we're trying to uh, reassure uh, the, the peaceful use of the technology where it remains. And there, there are a finite, you know, list of um, options you have. And um, I think the most uh, relevant and interesting uh, dimension here are uh, multilateral approaches uh, to the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, it had, you know, it had, there was a very active discussion a few years ago. Um, um, many proposals are on the table, but you know, so far nothing has really taken off. Uh, but I do think if uh, we really had a flagship project that would consider it in a very serious way with joint ownership, uh, with uh, a host country kind of offering territory. You have different countries coming in, our partners, and building this and operating the plant together. Uh, that might uh, raise the political cost, at least, uh, to kind of take over such a plant and use it for um, military purposes. So that's something we really have to work on, I think, uh, over the next decade. And I think we have the, uh, this decade to do exactly this. Um, coming to an end here. Um, Nuclear power, in my view, could make a, a significant contribution to uh, climate change mitigation. There are, it's time tested. There are few kind of uh, technical constraints that would kind of inhibit uh, a massive expansion. And um, of course, uh, the CO2 emissions are rather low. Uh, but to do so, however, nuclear power would have to be deployed very extensively, including in the developing world. And I argue, I would argue, the world is not now safe for such uh, an expansion. Uh, and fortunately, though, we, we, it doesn't have to be safe, uh, not yet, uh, because we couldn't expand nuclear energy anyway. So we have basically one decade uh, to um, address those, um, uh, those problems. Uh, not much capacity will, add it, will be added in the US and Europe. And we have time to establish the economics if we need to, as well as reestablish the once through fuel cycle, uh, and hopefully also uh, new norms of governance of the nuclear fuel cycle. And you know that's my last take here. I think nuclear disarmament, and we see some progress in, in, that, um, in that realm, should actually be or could be uh, a, an opportunity to support this process, because it really needs the support of the US and Russia. And when they start to encourage, um, uh, embrace a serious multilateral approaches, and maybe even the once through fuel cycle, uh, then we may actually see this happen. I don't think that nuclear energy can do it you know, by itself. And uh, that was it. That's my last <laughs> slide. Thank you, Alex. So the next phase here, uh, if the speakers would
just do a sound check here. Is this little battery, yeah, I think this is working. It works best about maybe five inches in front of us. Um, So, into phase two. Uh, Andy, I have a few questions, but if you'd like to begin, I'd be quite happy. Would you? Yeah, okay. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you all talked quite a lot about uh, our problems of power generation. We also have problems of transmission of power once generated. And I wondered if uh, any of you could talk about what more nuclear capacity would mean for the need to upgrade transmission capacities, especially if we're going to make any serious progress against, you know, automobiles being uh, prime users of and emitters of carbon. Well, okay, we have uh, obviously uh, significant transmission uh, and distribution uh, challenges. Is this working? This is fine. Yes. Um, the uh, today, I would say the the biggest driver of the transmission upgrade requirements are intermittent uh, renewables, uh, things like you know large wind in North Dakota, uh, et cetera. And in general, intermittent renewables do present a a, a challenge for for line loading, for 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 system stability, et cetera. I mean, in general, I think large nuclear plants. Uh, certainly, uh, over the time period of the next decade, for sure, uh, and even maybe into the next decade, uh, to the extent to which they are built in the United States, they are almost certainly going to be built at existing sites uh, that already have substantial transmission capacity. Uh, so there may be some additional uh, lines needed, but uh, rights of way issues, et cetera, I think are, are largely resolved. There's an entirely different issue uh, around uh, incorporating more intelligence into the grids, uh, using distributed generation, uh, and that is in fact a significant challenge, but I don't think, I don't think nuclear drives uh, that, that issue so much. Any other comments on that or should we proceed? Okay, we're going to let Ernie answer, Ernie's answer stand. Okay, so uh, Alex and I had a, a discussion uh, at around lunchtime, I guess a little before lunchtime, um, about kind of what the sort of key axes are of thinking about uh, nuclear energy. And I think one, one way to think about it is to think about sort of what are some of the key, or in what dimension are the key obstacles to nuclear energy uh, moving forward. So in our discussion, and tell me if I forgot one, but I think we, 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 we mentioned economics, we mentioned safety, we mentioned waste, this waste disposal prol and proliferation issues and perhaps other. So I would like to, uh, just as a quick poll so we can get on to other questions, I would like to ask each of the three panelists, I'll mention them again, economics, safety, waste, and proliferation. I'm curious whether we have uh, agreement or diversity of opinion about where the, what the key, the question is, which one or two of those is most important as an impediment to nuclear power moving forward? Let's say in the world, although if it's particularly different in the U.S., you can comment on that too. So, um, well, I would. I mean, I think in the U.S., it's it's just it's cost, it's the capital cost and the risk, um, and other countries sometimes don't. Uh, the markets don't determine what gets built, the government does, and, and they don't have to worry so much about costs. I do want to throw out one more, which has to do with water consumption. Uh, we're moving to a world that's going to have be hotter and more arid in many places, and that's going to affect, uh, you know, right now, nuclear power, I think, is the most water-intensive uh, uh, form of power, and um, in terms of its cooling. The, the cooling towers used, and I think we're going to ultimately have to. Uh, uh, most power plants are going to have to have very low water consumption, and uh, 
uh, but in this country, it's uh, the economics have to be so dramatically changed to get significant penetration that I don't think any other problem matters. Alex, well, I just talked 20 minutes about um, why I think the weapons connection is the most important one. Um, so I won't do that again. Um, but I do also realize that you know in the U.S. debate, it, it's not present. It's not part of the. Uh, the, um, the discussion, or uh, only on the periphery, the uh, National Academy report really only mentions it in, in, in passing, and, and that's something I think is a, is a problem. Uh, I do think that safety, uh, you know, could at any moment become a, a big deal. Uh, if in that sense, I think nuclear power is more brittle than other energy technologies. If you have a uh, a nuclear accident in, in Mexico, uh, would basically uh, be or could be a showstopper for, for the U.S. Uh, too. So in that sense, I think safety um, has to be high on the list and globally. And uh, I understand that waste disposal, of course, is, is a political uh, problem, um, as Ernie pointed out. We, there are good, uh, sound technical uh, options, um, not only repository, but also deep borehole. But politically, it's just very uh, difficult um, uh, to move forward, especially in other countries, e.g. in Japan, and South Korea, where there, it really is a domestic politics issue and, 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 and basically drives uh, the reprocessing debate, which I think is very unfortunate. And, and the fourth, another component, of course, is public opinion, uh, which we haven't mentioned. And the, the question is, uh, if you resolve all these issues, will public opinion uh, kind of uh, come your way, or is it something you have to address independently uh, from uh, the other problems? Um, I have a longer answer. <laughs> uh, first on the economics, uh, let me, uh, obviously I put a major emphasis uh, on the uh, economics, but uh, I think there was a little bit of a different uh, spin uh, from Joe's, um, I would say, more dire statements, and I don't agree with uh, all those characterizations. Uh, for example, uh, certainly today, uh, nuclear power is not the most expensive uh, form uh, solar and offshore wind uh, wind by a lot uh, on that today. So we can make extrapolations into the future, uh, of course, uh, but that is si simply not correct uh, uh, today. I don't think anyone would, would question that. Uh, I happen, uh, by the way, I, I agree with Joe. I'm very, very bullish on solar power eventually, and I think that's going to become an enormously important uh, source sooner than most people think, actually. But we also have the intermittency problems. In fact, I also would question another statement that we can debate. Uh, uh, I believe, I just do not understand the statement, uh, whether Chairman Wellinghoff said it or not, about baseload power. Uh, it just, in my view, does not make sense. Uh, and the issue was going to be nuclear, coal, the issues of carbon sequestration, and its cost are at least as uncertain uh, as those of, of nuclear. So it's going to be a complicated issue. And where we certainly agree is this next decade is critical to get those five to 10 plants built and understand what the economics are going to be uh, in the uh, United States. Also, Joe showed some uh, numbers. And I think this is very important in, as in a professorial educational role. Uh, you have to be extremely careful when you are shown numbers per kilowatt uh, in nuclear power. A number that is sometimes, but not today, quoted is the overnight cost. Roughly speaking, what would it cost you to build a plant if you could build it all today? Doesn't have the cost of capital, all kinds of issues coming in. Okay. Then there are other costs, which includes full costs, owner's costs. These are dramatically higher. I didn't bring a slide, but if you look, there's a. If you if you want to look at this, look at our MIT website, and look for a, a report um, called an update of the future of nuclear power. Go to the cost table, follow that to another link to a, to a report by Parsons and Dew, which has a very didactic appendix explaining how you go from one to the other. And you could see one utility put a cost out that looks 
60, 70 percent higher than another utility. Because one has quoted the overnight cost, and the other has quoted the full in cost, possibly even including transmission upgrades. You know why? They quote different numbers. They have different regulatory structures. One wants cost plus, and a high number looks better. Another may be in a more deregulated market, and the lower number looks better. So there's a lot of confusion. We can all talk about Finland and Areva, but Finland is clearly an outlier in principle, for reasons I could discuss. Now, it is true that if all nuclear projects are executed badly, they will cost that much. But the question is, will we, with the practice of building, say, five plants of a fixed design, in fact, learn to build them well? Again, I got no dog in this race. All I want is carbon to come down. But I think there's a lot of misinformation on that, and I think we have to put these costs in proper perspective. Just to go on then very, very briefly, uh, to I'll skip many of those, but waste. Uh, obviously, uh, the waste management issue is critically important. Uh, we are, in the United States, we have put ourselves into a box through poor project execution at a site that may or may not be good enough. It is not clear. It is certainly not an I Yucca Mountain was never an ideal site, technically. Whether it's good enough is something licensing would have determined. I have no judgment. What I do know is that there are successful programs in other parts of the world. Sweden has got a program. Very successful. Uh, they're moving forward. The French look to be going in, in, in a good direction. Again, technically, I believe that this is uh, quite doable. However, whether it's building a nuclear reactor or siting a waste repository, project execution is critical. We do not have a good track record. In your presentations, there was a huge amount of effort devoted to talking about the uncertainty involved in the viability of plants like this. And I, as an economist, I, I think that means that I'm not smart enough to understand all of that stuff. And I always want one policy lever, which is a price. And in fact, I wonder how much of the uncertainty in the viability of n nuclear reactors comes from the uncertainty in the world price of oil or um, the world price of carbon emissions. Um, would it be worth pressing, as a very simple policy, a minimum price of carbon? Well, okay, I'll, I'll go first, as the microphone is here. But uh, the, I think the issue is getting a price of carbon. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, right now, the minimum is zero. Uh, so uh, I, I think I mean, we, we probably all agree in this context. What we really want is a uh, clean, ideally a clean price signal, either through a tax or a cap and trade or, or some, some, some other way. Uh, and clearly, that any certainty in a price trajectory, which would be hard to hard to accomplish, uh, obviously would allow business decisions to be made in more in a more uh, in a more rational way. Uh, my fear, Joe mentioned the state of uh, legislation. Uh, uh, my fear remains that we will go for quite some time uh, without a actual climate bill. What we will do instead is is a collection of energy policies aiming towards low carbon, renewable portfolio standards, uh, loan guarantees, uh, you, you name it, they will not be coherent uh, and sometimes will act counter to each other. So a price on carbon, absolutely. And rather than minimum, it should be a price of carbon uh, that gets the job done in terms of the economy's response uh, to beating carbon, carbon targets. No, I, what I'm saying, ideally, uh, so let's take a cap and trade. Ideally, we take a, a decreasing carbon dioxide emissions cap and let the market determine the price, ideally. In reality, uh, no matter how we go about it, we're going to have to start uh, with a price that starts somewhere. I would choose something like $20. Uh, we've had, 
others will go lower, but twenty dollars will be good, and then allow it to ramp up as guided by a carbon policy. Does this want to comment? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think there's no question that, that, I mean, in an ideal world, you would have a shrinking cap on emissions and a rising price on carbon, and the marketplace would figure out what the cheapest way to, to meet that would be. I, I must say that, that this optimism that building five plants in the next decade is going to tell us anything about nuclear, I think, is very misplaced. The nuclear industry has made a, a fundamental mistake in this country. It just refused to agree on a single design or maybe two designs. We have, like, five designs out there. And we may build five different designs, and, and that will tell us nothing, because they're all going to go over budget, and they're all going to go over time. And the reason I don't quote overnight costs is because you can't build a nuclear power plant overnight, and no one has ever done it. And, and, and uh, historically, they have run wildly over time and, as a result, over budget. And even with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission trying to speed things up, Progress Energy just took a 20-month delay. And that was on, on because it could not get its design approved, even under the sped-up process, quickly enough. Uh, and and I, I think it just bears saying that that I th that I, that people who know solar photovoltaics financing would say that if you would give them the same deal that they that nuclear gets, they could deliver the power cheaper because in Florida you can actually and they do raise rates. 25% or more 10 years in advance of a single kilowatt hour ever showing up from nuclear power to pay for the construction. Now, all I can tell you is if you could raise rates in advance for energy efficiency or renewable energy in this country, you'd never build another nuclear power plant. So, you know, we've got right now, you to taxpayers are covering the total liability of a disaster under the Price-Anderson Act. You are covering 80% under the loan guarantee program of the financial risk of any power plant. I mean, it's stunning. If there were no government intervention, there would not be a nuclear industry in this country. And that's, you know, fine if you think that that's an important public policy outcome. All I can say is it's got 20% market share, and it's been around for decades, and I don't know why it continues to need a helping hand. I, I'll just say that, that what we will learn, uh, I'll just assert you know, uh, that what we will learn this decade from whatever few power plants get built is that nuclear power is among, you know, I won't say it's the most expensive option because, you know, s satellite based solar is always going to be more expensive. Um, <laughs> but um, a half a dozen other major options, if competed on a level playing ground with nuclear, would just kick its butt. So, uh, just let me say, I mean, this is, sorry, but this is, this is uh, just not accurate. Uh, well, I hope that, in fact, uh, these costs come down on renewables, for example. Uh, uh, you know, in my, in, my, uh, in my neighborhood, you know, we all talk about Cape Wind as an example, Cape Wind Project. And the, uh, it's, you know, I can't, I, I, I'm strong, so I got no dog in this race. I want carbon to come out. Love wind, love solar especially, to be honest. Uh, Cape Wind, all you hear about is all the f wrangling over siting of the windmills, et cetera, in a particularly favorable location offshore. And the papers no longer talk about the issue that they want 30 cents a kilowatt hour. That's the reality. And the reality is, it's about cost in the end. Now, nuclear power's levelized costs can be, with project execution, reasonable. But as we've all agreed, it's got a financing problem in structure, it's large capital costs. I remind you, renewables have an equally high capital cost per kilowatt, but a much better financing structure because of modularity. All of these issues are going to compete in the marketplace uh, and I would just add to what Joe, what you just said, as I said earlier, if, if we're going to build five reactors in this decade as a test, they should be, as I said, of a standardized design. I completely agree with you. If we build five of ones of each, we will accomplish nothing. So 
I think this is going to be my last question because I want to give the audience a chance. And I also think this can be, although I could be wrong, I think this can be a very quickly answered question. But I, but I do want to hear from each panelist to see if we have agreement on this. One thing I heard loud and clear, and this was not by design, but this particular group of three people, I think it's fair to say, all sees climate as a huge thing that we need to respond to. I don't think I heard really much difference on that. And so I would simply ask as a point of information, as a percentage of the carbon intensity of current base load power, let's take the United States just to make it simple, OK? What magnitude of reduction in carbon intensity of electricity generation are we talking about on a life cycle basis from nuclear power? I mean, if we're going to offer it as a solution, let's put its credentials on the table, and let's see if, in fact, there is consensus on the table. Is the question clear? What, what's, the, what's the carbon intensity no, versus coal or something? No, no, ver versus the current baseload mix, or if it, yeah. We, we use natural, you know, 50% uh, coal. You know the numbers better than I do. Natural gas, nuclear, hydro, what have you. OK. So from the power sector, that's what you said, power sector, right? Yes, electricity, yes. Power sector, 50% of power is coal. About 80% of emissions, carbon emissions, are from coal. Uh, natural gas is now up over 20% in terms of supply. Uh, and it's essentially the remainder oil be used very, very little. It's the remainder of the carbon emissions. Uh, and nuclear, hydro, wind, solar are quasi-zero. Sorry. What I'm asking is, as a percentage of that mix in, for example, uh, grams of carbon equivalent per unit electricity generated, although I'm really not into dimensions here, as a percentage of the current power generation, are we talking a 95% reduction in carbon emissions for nuclear power? Is that not a relevant question? You have a. I don't understand this question. Maybe they do you guys understand the question? Here, help me out here. <laughs> I, th I thought it might be simple. But uh, well, I'll just I'll make certain statements, and one of them might be what you're trying to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I think. Nu nuclear itself is essentially carbon free. Uh, we enrich a lot of uranium, and it's done by dedicated coal plants in this country. So it's, uh, but but fundamentally, nuclear power itself is carbon free. We have 100 nuclear plants, and it's 20 percent of generation. If you're asking what share of the emissions reduction in the coming decades do we anticipate come from new nuclear plants, that's what I thought you were asking. No, no. No, sorry. <laughs> let, let, let me, I'll try one more time, but it may not be worth any more time than that. Do all three of you agree that nuclear power is fundamentally carbon free on a life cycle basis? If the answer is yes, we can move on. Well, in the, yeah, in, in this country, it, it, I mean, I, I, I would say it's about 10% of the equivalent output of coal. Yeah, life sure. Power. Yes. Okay. There you go. But which is which is more than wind? I mean, wind is uh, even lower. Ninety percent reduction relative to coal. If that's close enough, fine. Do you want to ask more questions, or should we turn it over to the audience? Okay. All right. Excuse me, just a second. So, I was all about to violate my own advice. We have here a microphone. We only have one of these microphones. But what, we, what I'd like to do is to uh, have people who have questions identify themselves. And Andy and I will take turns uh, calling on you. It is useful if you would use the microphone, even if you have a big voice, because it makes more of a difference for the, uh, the taping. And uh, we can try that as well. But I, I kind of. If we can get the microphones to you, I'd just assume that the questions uh, stand in the words of the askers. But in any case, it is now your turn. And uh, right there is question number one in the black shirt. I'm going to pass the microphone up. And if that really doesn't work, we'll repeat the questions. Thank you. And I'll do the same for you. <laughs> Seems like we have a few ideas on this point. But. 
Thank you. Um, so as an econ major, there's a special place in my heart for cost-benefit analysis. So I just want to throw in another wrench into this cost debate. Um, Professor Bonis, you showed that interesting uh, diagram of the levelized costs of the various fuel sources. I'm assuming that includes only direct business costs and not potential external social costs. So if we were to theoretically factor in externalities into that cost calculation, like the potential of plant met meltdowns, um, local ecological impacts like we see at Vermont Yankee, or at least the beginnings of which we see at Vermont Yankee, and uh, potential social costs of mining, ecological damages there, would that have a significant impact on the social viability of this um, and its sort of net costs to our society? And that's for all. I, I cannot answer that question in any quantitative uh, way. Uh, I will observe uh, that uh, if you take the worst accident in the United States, uh, TMI, uh, in the late 70s, uh, it had no discernible public health impact uh, as agreed to by the state. Uh, uh, it did cost some investors a few billion dollars. So that you know, I, that's not a social cost in that sense because the I would argue that the the public health benefits were, uh, public health effects were were, were not there. Uh, now there are other, for all of these sources, there are various ways. And again, I, I will make no attempt at a quantitative answer. But in coal, you have the very obvious uh, issues, at least without capture uh, or control of criteria pollutants and mercury, et cetera. You've got to factor those in with natural gas. There's arguments going on about the environmental costs of producing in shale uh, with uh, wind. There's the various issues of, uh, if nothing else, visual uh, concerns in certain places, like Cape Wind, uh, by observation. Uh, there are land use issues. There are, there are water issues, as Joe mentioned. Uh, although, by the way, uh, war nuclear is not worse on a per output basis. It's just the plants are very large. But actually, what Joe raised, you know, it, it's, this is an in interesting point, uh, I think, that if you ask about water use, uh, clearly irrigation, agriculture, is by far the dominant water use. But if you ask about water utilization, thermal power plants are as big as irrigation. So there's a lot of water goes through and it's returned at a higher temperature, et cetera. So there's lots and lots of issues. I cannot quantify them. But it's, I would say that there are issues across, across the board uh, in uh, all these energy sources. I mean, I think one point that Ernie's slide made, which gets to this, is the risk premium. Th th there's clearly a recognition by an investor that if things go south, it is a staggering cost for somebody. And that is factored into the finance. I mean, it's why if there were no government loan program, there definitely, you know, no one would be financing plants. Like you, the taxpayers, are, are taking 80 percent of the risk because it's just wh whatever the probability of an accident is, and no one can know for certain, whoever swallows that risk is betting their entire financial future uh, on that plant. and and not many people are prepared to do that all by themselves. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, my name's Peter Roth. I've been a member for about 18 years now on image, uh, ISO image permanent standards and image storage, and I can tell you from my experience, it's extremely difficult to get standards out that everybody can agree on. And this is in a field that I would assume is much simpler than getting standardization in nuclear. Since you all focus on the issue of cost, and power companies have a high, very high risk and uncertainty about the future market, because it takes a while to build a plant, where's the market going, will the customers be there? Why is there such a large focus on building big plans instead of looking at a standardization of smaller, more modular plants that could be easily turned out in a much more rapid cycle. And I have a basis for uh, understanding that. Perhaps you can answer those points. Well, the, the, the light water reactor technology, at least, is, is driven to larger and larger scale by economies of scale. And so that's, that's the simple answer for that direction. Uh, is with regard to standardization, uh, uh, I do think that now in the United States, 
By the way, like in France, they had right from the beginning kind of a standard design. Uh, now, now they have this new version, but, but most of their construction was a standard design, and the benefits of that were seen, in fact. Uh, I think here, <laughs> we're, moving to a st we're moving to a standard design, except as Joe said, unfortunately, it's like five standard designs. Uh, and I think those are going to get sorted out in the marketplace. I'll give you an example of marketplace choices not yet clear. Uh, Joe mentioned these plants, like in Finland and uh, elsewhere, uh, which are uh, an Areva Siemens design. Uh, they were shocked when they lost the bid to, for the new plants in the Emirates. Mm -hmm. uh, and it raised an issue, did they in some sense over-engineer the plant? It is viewed as kind of the gold-plated safety feature plant, and maybe the market isn't going to end up wanting that in certain parts of the world at least, et cetera. So I think how it sorts out is clear, but everybody understands, and the, the, the NRC process that Joe alluded to uh, is built around the idea of standardization by giving, in a certain sense, a, a pre-licensing review to a standard design, and if you stick to it, you will only have to answer site-specific questions. So there's a strong pressure towards that. Now, on the smaller plants, um, uh, and, and they, they were described uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, we don't know yet what they'll cost, OK? But there, um, what I would say is the big hope there is the small plants do, will obviously will not benefit from the economy of scale by, by definition. On the other hand, can they benefit from an economy of manufacturing? That is, can you get, get them not only modular, but modularized so that they are factory units that only have to be, in some sense, assembled on site? Because a lot of the cost, the cost problems we had with nuclear power plants meant anything you do the second time is very expensive. And so that's an interesting direction that where technology could take us. Up uh, uh, there, uh, or maybe you're making your own decisions. Yeah. The mic seems to be. Okay. I see. Open source. So what are, yeah, are there any comments? Do you guys have any comments on the future of high temperature gas cooled or ultra high temperature reactors uh, from an economic standpoint and technical standpoint? All right. <laughs> All right. Um, high temperature gas reactors are, are, are very attractive. Uh, in a few ways. Uh, the high temperature, first of all, suggests that they are more th thermally efficient, which is a good thing. Um, they also have some safety advantages in terms of the fuel form, if the QA is in fact uh, borne out. Um, there's not much experience in terms of knowing the cost. We had a, we, we had a very early gas plant in uh, St. Brain. Um, uh, and it was pulled off by Public Service Colorado in a very short, with a very short lifetime. Uh, however, the failures, turns out, were not with the fundamental core. It was with a very bad balance of plant design. So I think we actually don't know the answer, but we are very bullish on getting a strong R&D program, especially on fuel qualification, which would be very important to go out at scale, uh, and, as well as some of the system integration issues. My, my simple view of a, a power plant is it's a steam engine and it's connected to something that makes steam. And you could make steam with coal, you can make it with uh, natural gas, you can make it with nuclear energy. Boiled water. I beg your pardon? Boiled water. Boiled water, yes, under pressure. Very, very hot. Uh, my, what I'm not getting a good grip on is why does a nuclear power plant cost so much money? Could you break it down? And I'd like to hear, you know, just from an engineering point of view, and then I'm sure you're going to add things about regulations and so on and so forth. But uh, I got a very, you know, speaker number two was very negative about this, and, uh, but I don't understand where, where the questions come in. Let's try using this one. Uh, uh, why does a nuclear power plant cost? Well, 
I mean, there's many factors. I mean, right now, one of the reasons nuclear power plants cost a lot of money is that since we haven't built many in a long time, there are a lot of bottlenecks. There, I mean, we've lost a great many vendors, and, and there's like one manufacturer of a complete solid containment vessel, and so they're back-ordered, and they can charge whatever the market will bear, and there are countries out there that will bear a pretty high price. Um, and uh, then you have, you know, these, these uh, have to be engineered to pretty high safety standards because of Three Mile Island and, and Chernobyl. And so uh, there is a lot of oversight, even in countries that don't have... Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, the, e even in countries that don't have a, the safety standards we have, there's a lot of uh, 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 emphasis on, on over-engineering, as, as uh, Ernie said. But uh, if you want to take it any further than that, Ernie, that's fine. Just to reinforce what Joe said, for example, this question of large forgings, this is very special. Uh, and, and, and as Joe said, and now that skill has j gone down to only Japan. Uh, but now you see some other places are trying to establish, including in India. Uh, by the way, <laughs> this is another comment. The fact that India can now re can establish a major forging capacity, and I'm not sure if we can do it in the United States. We have a question over here. I guess we're going to get both mics in play, and we'll work both sides of the room. So please go ahead. So um, I'm not a science major, so I apologize if my question is ignorant. But um, I was watching a video on TEDx recently, and Bill Gates was talking about this thing called Terra Power. And I was wondering where they use the remains of uranium or something like the waste created by power plants. And I was wondering, what is that? And is it a viable option? Or was Bill Gates just going bonkers? Um, when you say nuclear, are you t do you include that? And he also talked about, he talked about how nuclear power is very water intensive. And Bill Gates <laughs> said that you could kind of process seawater cheaply or something and use it for nuclear power. And he talked, he talked about it in terms of using it for that. Terra power thing. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk about that. Is that like a very new thing or does it already exist? I think uh, the reactor uh, Bill Gates is now um, excited about is um, the so called traveling wave reactor, which would basically have uh, all its fuel. Uh, the fuel it needs for um, the entire life. It's not a new idea. I guess it's actually another idea that Edward Teller originally had in, in the 1950s or so. And it basically, the idea is to burn uh, the fuel like uh, almost like in, in a candle um, and leaving the waste behind and breeding new fuel uh, in front of it. Um, it turns out it, it's fundamentally a, a fast breeder reactor in that case it's a sodium cooled um, type of reactor i don't think this is a good a wise investment um, even though he should know better uh, it's not something that could be built anytime soon uh, and and deployed on on a broader scale so um, i would not give it the highest priority and it's not a kind of a, a revolutionary um, kind of concept that no one has thought about before the appeal of course is that you have all the fuel kind of on, on site in place and you never have to ship anything to or from the site I and mean, that's uh, the big uh, but it's still a very complex technology the big uh, the big technical Achilles heel um, uh, which maybe can be overcome would be in the materials of the cladding uh, there'd be an enormous neutron fluence over the lifetime of this and and there's a a, re a real serious materials issue which is not yet not yet there on the other hand you know I think uh, I'm encouraged by the idea that there are there's new, some new thinking going on, at least, about different kinds of reactors. Uh, Alex showed one, uh, the B&W uh, modular reactor, uh, so there's more thinking. However, whether it's this reactor or any other new one, maybe with the exception of the gas reactor because of its history, could be a little bit faster, but this is a business that is, thankfully, rather conservative in, in, in technically uh, going into new ground. Uh, regulatory licensing of a new technology in this business is really something. Uh, you cannot, it's impossible for me to see how any genuinely step out technology can be employed in less than kind of a 20, 25 year time scale. 
Now that's fine. So we, you know, we should be looking at these. But I just go back now to the climate message. In my view, I support this R&D, but let's keep our eye on the ball. The real question right now, for the, so certainly for the United States, is will nuclear power be a material contributor or not to lowering carbon? And if it's going to do that, it's going to be because we start building a lot of light water reactors. And that's going to happen only if, in fact, the kind of cost argument that we've been having is resolved on the more positive side than on the negative side. And I have no idea how it'll turn out. But that's the game. The game is light water reactors, slight evolutionary improvements uh, for at least several decades. I'm Mike. Um, I, I think uh, I've heard the argument before that the personal uh, gas-powered hybrid car is a transient and uh, at that not a very good uh, transient solution that if you just went all the way to electric you would not have to pay the cost of going to this transient solution. Could that be an analogy to uh, nuclear if someday we're going to be an entirely solar uh, energy profile? And, and someday might even be within 60 or 70 years. Considering that, and I believe I heard this in, in someone's presentation, that the current uh, kilowatt cost of solar, and I mean solar, solar photovoltaic or solar thermal or whatever is most efficient, uh, is around what nuclear is, uh, considering you know the lower uh, policy, international costs, and, and just the, the state of the art. Well, um, I, I think, I, I hope at least one of my slides made clear that I, one wouldn't want to say there's any going to be any one solution uh, uh, over the next few decades. Uh, just because of the staggering scale of, of zero carbon and low carbon energy that we need. So let's say I'm very bullish on solar uh, and, and I still would only say, you know, solar photovoltaics and solar thermal might be, you know, uh, a third of the solution by 2050. Um, but um, I, I would agree 100% with Ernie. If, if nuclear industry could get its act together, then it will be a player. I, I, it, you know, the nuclear industry would be delighted to be one wedge. They, they would be delighted. They, would, they could go home tomorrow and say, just let us be a wedge and you can have all your other forms of power. So it's a staggering amount of energy. To, to even, I mean, anybody who's a half a wedge is going to be very, very rich in, in this world. But they are going to have to show certain things. They're going to have to come in under 15 cents a kilowatt hour levelized cost, mostly carbon free and integrable into a grid at relatively straightforward cost uh, and not a lot of other negatives. Can't use vast amounts of water. Um, have to be materially scale scalable, can't use exotic materials that are going to be, they, ha they can't have any bottlenecks. They have to be scalable without bottlenecks at a reasonable price and have good ge fairly good geographic diversity. So, you know, that's a challenge. That just narrows down all your choices uh, uh, to, you know, ones that you can enumerate on both hands. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not here to rule out nuclear. It has to prove itself. All the other technologies do too. Now, the cost curves on photovoltaics, there's multiple different types of technologies of photovoltaics. There's staggering amounts of money going into it. Many of them are coming down in cost. The industry is commoditizing. And if you talk to the people that I think know what they're talking about, like Jigger Shaw, who, who, who founded Sun Edison, you know, they, they will tell you the cost is competitive now with the kind of financing that they can get. Um, but, you know, solar uh, can't produce, you know, solar photovoltaics to produce half, you know, 20% of U.S. electricity, that's a whole different ball game. That requires grid integration and, and some type of storage. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of time. We're not going to do that overnight. So the point is, a lot of things have to evolve simultaneously, including a, trans a transmission system and a smarter, flexible grid. Um, and, you know, I don't think anybody could possibly predict today exactly which specific technologies are going to win. Um, but uh, 
I think it, you know, the end game is there's just a heck of a lot of solar energy hitting large parts of the world near where people live. And that's, that's going to be a major, major winner, uh, you know, in your lifetime. And uh, I, I agree with that. I just want to reinforce the point that, uh, first of all, as, actually, as Joe said in his talk, if you look at any of the kinds of carbon targets talked about over this century, um, essentially completely decarbonizing the power sector by mid-century looks to be a necessary piece when coupled with substantial demand reduction uh, from, uh, so you need both of them, substantial demand reduction and decarbonizing <coughs> electricity so that you've still got a little carbon to use uh, in transportation fuels, et cetera, et cetera. That's number one. Then you look at the options, and I, I think we have a lot of options. They are hard, but it goes back to a message, again, that we, I think we're quite consistent on is that this is the decade we've got to come out with an understanding of the options. Uh, and that's as true in solar as it is in nuclear. Uh, offshore wind right now has got huge challenges to be a, 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 a credible, an economically credible competitor. By the way, solar thermal has also got water issues. Uh, in fact, there was a plant denied a license because of water issues in California. So, you know, none of these are insurmountable, and this is where I think the Dean's uh, statement about uh, dedicating engineering talent uh, in these areas is, is so important. Uh, yesterday at MIT we had a full day uh, invitation workshop on electrification of transportation. Okay? And for whatever it's worth, I came out of the day feeling more optimistic on the core like battery technology and where it was going on the cost curve but less optimistic on, on being able to do the distribution system integration that, that one would need. And that's just the way it's, you know, we have a whole bunch of technical problems, and in the end, we got to get the whole system uh, working together. Hi. Um, the National Academy of Sciences, the current proceedings, um, there's a study that just came out saying that uh, electric power from offshore wind via synoptic scale interconnection behaves like baseload power. Um, and what they did, they studied offshore wind off the US East Coast, um, basically basing it on the buoys, et cetera, that currently detect wind. Um, and they found that if they were to simulate interconnecting appropriately placed wind towers, and I understand there are social issues with placing wind towers, but if we can overcome that, um, then it behaves like wind, uh, baseload power instead of intermittent. Um, and if this turns out to be generalizable, what do you think the implications are for our power system? Um, <laughs> well, look, you know, um, every, every strategy has its pluses and minuses. Uh, uh, you know, I spent five years in the Department of Energy, and I can't tell you how many PowerPoint presentations I saw that the last two slides said explain why one, this was the solution to all of our problems, and second, in year five of the business plan, they're making $100 million a year in profits. Um, I, offshore wind is very promising. It, it, has, it has huge challenges. It certainly has a better load profile than a lot of other uh, 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 ge yeah, ge geographic locations for wind. Wind integrates well with solar. You know, from my point of view, concentrated solar, coupled with wind, you know, mostly wind uh, inland is, is during the nighttime. Um, now it's being, for, you know, brought into the grid, it, it's often being married with natural gas, sometimes demand response is sort of used as the backup of last resort, and uh, we're building staggering amounts of wind, I mean, you know, seven to eight gigawatts a year, and um, one can integrate it into the grid, uh, I, I think, pretty straightforwardly. It's, it's like I said, it brings natural gas and, and, and demand response. Offshore wind has proved a challenge everywhere it's being pursued. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's got a long way to go to prove itself. Its main advantage is that it's near population centers. That's, I think, a, a key reason why people are pursuing it. If one didn't have to worry about transmission, the, world, the United States has plenty of wind and then you just have to deal with, 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 um, with storage. 
Now, you know, we're talking about an evolution over decades. So if the, ele if the transportation system electrifies, then we're going to have a staggering amount of storage capacity in the form of batteries in cars that are used two to four hours a day for driving. And, you know, 20 hours a day, you're just going to have a staggering amount of storage capacity. So I'm very bullish on the electrification of the transportation system. It's not going to happen in 10 years. But if it really starts to become one of those technologies that is demonstrated, commercialized this decade, and explodes, you know, the, if, the, if the turning point, the cusp is 2020, then it will be a game changer for um, uh, for the integration of renewables. Um, in part also because there's going to be an aftermarket for batteries, because after the batteries aren't useful in the car anymore, they will be of value to an electric utility. So um, the, but that will also require, as Ernie said, a massive upgrade of the, of the electric grid, which, which is, you know, uh, a, a 19th century uh, 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 almost technology uh, in, in, in many respects. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I agree 100% with we, we We have to invest as much as is humanly possible in uh, commercial and near commercial technologies. And the one point I want to add to what Ernie said is that, uh, and, and the International Energy Agency did a major study on this in 2000. There, if you want to lower the costs of a clean energy technology, you can do it through breakthrough R&D research, or you can do it by pushing that technology in the marketplace and going down the experience and learning curve and learning how technologies work in the marketplace and getting economies of scale. And that, in fact, from my perspective, is is the best route and the most successful route. That was the point of this international, the IEA report. That if you really want to bring down the cost of technologies, get them into the, get them into the marketplace and do innovation as opposed to holding your breath, waiting for breakthrough technologies, which which in the energy arena are are few and far between. Foot, uh, footnote: um, the the huge upgrade of the transmission uh, of of the grid and. And by grid, I want to make clear. I also, I really mean also distribution system. Uh, that the upgrade in the regulatory structure of the T and D system is probably going to be more challenging than the upgrade of the physical elements uh, of of the structure. And then, secondly, I will just neutrally quote my colleague John Deutsch, who says, "Learning curves are the refuge of scoundrels." <laughs> <laughs> You can argue with John. <laughs> uh, no, I would never argue with John. I would just say, you know, that, that we have seen remarkable improvements in the cost of a number of technologies, like photovoltaics, like wind. And there is staggeringly, I mean, and I would say this to all the students who are studying engineering, there will never be an exhaustion of the need for good engineers. And, and people are doing very sophisticated things you, you might think wind technology is just a blade that rotates. It is far beyond that. Um, I mean, people are putting lasers on. Uh, I just did a post on you know people who want to put laser sensors on the wind turbines to help them anticipate, see the wind coming, and plan for it coming. I mean, you know, people are going to change how we manufacture those blades, what materials they are made out of, how you forecast wind. I mean, it's just. Even something, uh, technology that has been around for literally centuries uh, has vast room for innovation and engineering improvement. Just to pick up on that message, I had one more, one more issue which came up yesterday. Uh, uh, my colleague Bill Mitchell, an architect, Larry Burns, former CTO of GM, uh, they've been thinking a lot about future vehicles. goes back to this electrification. And, you know, all I, all I want to make is the point. The point that they make is that as we go to a technology transition, potentially, like electrification and transportation, we have to not think technically about, roughly speaking, putting a battery in a standard car. Because that technology may now allow you to do very different things. And so if you, you, if you integrate with information technology, suddenly you can have in urban environments 
a very, very different driving paradigm, which then allows you to lightweight the vehicle safely, which then allows you to use a much smaller battery, which means the costs aren't as big. And so we really got to think also how these things link together in a system way and not just be rooted in a different way of boiling water or a battery in a conventional car. <laughs> We're going to take two more questions, one from that side of the room, one from over here, and then there will be an opportunity to ask the speakers more questions uh, out of the reception. So one more from over there. Andy, you can do the picking. Um, so I understand the, uh, the situation is unprecedented, but I still feel like I need a little bit of a history lesson. Um, this thing about the, the dog hunting, which, which dog can hunt, um, and the idea that it will take about a decade to find out uh, which dog can hunt. Talk to me about what dogs we know can't hunt, how long it took us to find that out, and where this figure of 10 years comes from. Please. Which dogs can't hunt? <laughs> very, very briefly, only very briefly about the 10 years, I guess it really, um, it's a good point. Why 10 years? Uh, and I don't have a good answer. Uh, obviously, two or three years uh, won't be enough uh, because nothing really relevant is, it would be happening in two or three years. I mean, you really need these, uh, you know, five, six years to actually build uh, uh, and demonstrate uh, projects. And you know, on the, upper, on the opposite end, uh, 20 years would be too late, I guess. Um, there is also a consensus uh, that that can't be. We have this decade to basically deploy energy efficiency uh, technologies, uh, but then something else has to happen. And um, if uh, either CCS, carbon capture, and, and storage is not available by then, or if nuclear turns out to be expensive, then uh, we may have to kind of, uh, of, you know, take, consider different options still. I mean, and, and the, the, as the academy turned, uh, you know, emphasized that it would be very, very difficult if, if we had to take uh, one or even two off the table at that point. Um, I think the, the Chinese have a saying that the best time to plant a tree uh, was 20 years ago. And, you know, we squandered a lot of time and we dawdled when we were warned that we didn't have time to dawdle. I, you know, I, I think that um, we're not even serious about global warming yet, and most people in this room, certainly the students, will live to see us get desperate about it. Um, from my perspective, if we could pass a climate bill, then we would have a global deal and we would do, as Ernie said, in, in the next 10 years, the, the, the choices for deep emissions reductions are, are you know, you're going to want to do a lot of energy efficiency, you know, coal to gas substitution, a certain amount of uh, uh, renewables, you should stop deforestation. But then you have to put the pedal to the metal. You have to start deploying at a staggering scale. I mean, literally factors of 10 greater uh, deployment or more than we're doing now. So I think the point is, I, I think all of us would love to deploy everything we have. I mean, I would like to deploy every last piece of hardware we have now as hard as possible for as long as possible. Um, but the United States does not appear ready politically to do so. I would certainly urge you to lobby your senators, particularly one in particular could use some lobbying to support uh, a climate bill. Um, uh, but if there is no national level action now, then the best one can do is just try to commercialize as much technology as possible. And when we get desperate, the stuff that works will be deployed, you know, I think, at a, you know, if, if you heard James Hansen here a year ago, at a World War II scale level. And, but that requires a certain amount of desperation. Um, but, you know, we replaced the entire manufacturing system in this country in, in a year, you know, 60 years ago. We just stopped making, you know, consumer cars and we became the arsenal of democracy. Um, it would require a certain level of desperation to do that. But the key point is we don't, we haven't commercialized the solution in the transportation sector yet. And. I have a very good idea of what that might be, and the same in the electric utility sector, but certain technologies still need 
uh, to be commercialized before we can really uh, bet, bet the farm on them. Uh, let's just add one, just one very brief. One very brief. Uh, you are talking about dogs that don't hunt. Um, uh, I'm not saying this dog will never hunt, but there are time scales. And so, an example, uh, and I always feel 2050 is the horizon that we should be thinking about managing to something like fusion, for example. Uh, I think is, very, is certainly very unlikely to be a scalable commercial uh, uh, entity in that kind of time frame. But you know. But others are quite possible. Um, and the, why the 10 years is right, I certainly agree. We don't have much more time. But it's also the case that 10 years is a typical time for key technology uh, demonstrations. We've talked about nuclear. Let me just mention one other one, sequestration, carbon sequestration. Uh, if you think in terms of what we need for proper demonstration of sequestration, what you need is the order of six to eight years of cumulative injections of one to two megatons a year. So it kind of fits in this time scale as well. If we start now, the trouble is most of us would, would think that a, a back of the envelope number of what we need to be investing in, these, in this RD and D program is probably the order of 15 billion a year in the United States alone maybe a bit more, but let's say 15. The trouble is, historically, uh, he only got to manage a billion, and DOE only got to manage, it's really about two and a half billion dollars. So we are, an or we are an order of magnitude off in scale. We've had one major jolt, the recovery package, put about 13 billion into energy RD&D. &D. But if that's going to be a one-time shot, it's great. But it doesn't keep our, our sustained effort for uh, for the decade. Yeah, um, we've been talking exclusively about nuclear fission as energy source. Um, where is nuclear fusion considered to be in moving towards viability? Uh, do we completely ignore that as a potential source until it is considered viable? And what resources should we be putting into it and in moving it towards viability? Not sure. <laughs> it's dangerous to say something about fusion, I guess. Um, but you know, I hang out uh, actually quite a bit with um, the former director of the Princeton Plasma Physics uh, Lab, Rob Goldston, who who uh, thinks that fusion might um, uh, become an option. Obviously, uh, in the second half of the century, the uh, what is happening in the, in the case of fusion is. Um, uh, there is this demonstration project uh, going on, um, the ITER, which will be built uh, over the next uh, 10, 15 years or so uh, in France, uh, international project. Everyone is uh, participating. And I think it's fair to say that once we gather the experience from, from that facility by 2030 or so, uh, we may uh, know whether or not it's going to play a role in the second half of the century. Um, but you know the joke that fusion is always 50 years away. But I, I, I do think that in, in about 20 years, we will definitely know more about um, whether or not it's going to work. I hope uh, that it will come soon enough uh, so that we can avoid this uh, step uh, going into uh, the closed fuel cycle and deploying breeder reactors uh, globally, which I think would be a far you know, a worse uh, kind of choice of technology. So that's, uh, that's the thing on, on a fusion. So as you see, I mean, we, we've agreed, I mean, that, that for this half century, at least by 2050, uh, it's not going to be a commercially active, but it's open uh, beyond that. However, I'll add one more thing. Uh, this is a, a view that I, I think this is, again, a place where uh, we have done a foolish thing. Uh, we have narrowed down to one technology long before it is obvious that it's the right technology. Uh, uh, the, I think we've had far too little work in alternative concepts, exploring new issues, especially when, when I look at the Tokamak. This is a big, heavy iron uh, machine. I look at that machine and I say, okay, maybe ITER will succeed. It'll get ignition, et cetera, et cetera. But is it going to be, is that technology incredibly cost competitive 
if you look about look at capital costs of a fission plant and now start dreaming about the capital costs of a tokamak, I agree with Joe. Solar was going to race right by it. 